So, um, Michael is from the University of Lincoln in the United Kingdom. He's well known in the SAI fraternity. In fact, I remember him from 2016. That was my first SAI conference. And I also remember how friendly you were there, Michael. And um, I think the reason he's well known in the SAI fraternity is because he's a homeboy, having been based at UWC until he recently immigrated to the UK. His interests are critical pedagogy, educational technology, and health and social care. And recently, his research interests have moved towards AI in higher and professional education, but he's also interested in expanded notions of what it means to engage in scholarly activities. And I'm really looking forward to having published a paper that deals with your topic, Michael. Um, I'm very interested in hearing about comparative studies in ETEC. So thank you very much. Handing over to you. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, just to check, can you see my slides and uh, hear me OK? All good, Michael. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I changed my title a little bit. Um, I realized that I was being quite prescriptive in my initial um, suggestion. And uh, I thought I thought I'd be able to be prescriptive. I thought that this was a relatively cut and dried um, question and that I'd be able to mount a convincing argument for why we shouldn't do comparative studies. Um, I haven't changed my position, but I realized soon after I started preparing for this that I was arguing myself into a corner and I didn't really know how to get out of it. Um, and so I think I've come up with something that might be interesting and maybe insightful, but uh, maybe not correct. Um, all right. So I also have to apologize, except for this first slide, I have to apologize for the amount of information on the slides. Um, usually when I'm testing out an idea, I have to write it out as a story, and that necessitates a lot of words. There's a great quote, um, I forget who said it, but um, uh, the person said, I apologize for the length of this letter. If I had more time, I would have made it shorter. And that's exactly how I feel with the slides. I haven't been able to condense some of the ideas into something a little bit more concise. I'm going to start with a story that was written by Larry Gruppen. He published it in uh, Medical Education in the early 2000s um, as a paper where he, he asked if medical education research is hard or soft. So he says, consider the following. You're testing the mechanism of an airborne viral infection on lung function. You have a line of carefully bred rats, all genetically identical. You keep them under controlled conditions of temperature, food, exposure to the environment and isolation from other rats. You expose them to the virus under conditions that ensure they get identical levels of exposure. If desired, you expose them to the virus multiple times at specified intervals. After an appropriate period of time, you sacrifice the rats and examine the lung tissue for evidence of the effect of the virus. Now, if you were going to take the same design and implement it under the conditions of educational research, you would have something like the following. Your rats come from everywhere. White rats, sewer rats, pet rats, roof rats, Norwegian rats, and even a few mice. You've got no control over where the rats live, what they eat, what they do, what other rats they consort with, or what activities they pursue. You expose them to the airborne virus in a large room when all the rats are gathered together by releasing the aerosol at the front of the room and letting it spread through the rest of the room. During this exposure interval, some rats come in late, some leave early, some are sleeping, and therefore breathe in less of the virus, while others are active and breathe in more. And of course, some of the rats aren't even there. If you want to have multiple exposures, some of the rats from the first exposure will now be absent, whereas others will show up for the first time. After exposure, many of the rats intentionally try to share the virus with their fellow rats. At the same time, dozens of other researchers are using the same rats for their own studies, exposing them to different agents, running them through mazes, observing their behaviors and feeding them a range of diets. Instead of holding them in controlled conditions, you have to release them back into the wild where they roam freely engaging in all sorts of unexpected activities and exposing themselves to other sorts of viruses. When it comes time to perform the autopsies to examine the effects of the virus, you first have to catch as many of the rats as possible. Most evade capture completely, so you offer food to entice them. When you finally have them trapped, some of the rats don't even look familiar, and you question whether they were part of this, the study. Then you find that the ethics board denies you the opportunity to sacrifice the rats. Instead, you must develop tests to infer the effects of the virus, or have them complete questionnaires to ask them how they feel. Okay, so the reason I chose that, that story is because I think it really gives us a good sense of 
some of the challenges that we have in trying to evaluate the effect of teaching on learning. And that really is what I want to talk about today. Some of the challenges that we have when we couple teaching to learning. So I, I was recently introduced to this idea that systems domesticate technology. We keep on talking about how technology is going to disrupt higher education. And what we constantly see is that the technology actually gets um, molded into the shape of higher education. And I think a, a recent example of this was MOOCs. You know, MOOCs was supposed to completely dismantle the structures of higher education. And all that we've seen is that the most common MOOCs, the most popular ones, are the ones that look exactly like the worst parts of higher education. Um, so I, I really like this idea that Neil Selwyn um, and Manuel Castells talk about. Uh, people assume that educational technologies are just tools. They're neutral and they're free from values and intent. But we forget that the, the values and intentions of the people who design those tools um, are embedded within the tools. Um, Castells talks about how social and cultural norms within which new technologies are created to determine how the technology is used and understood. And again, we see this in higher education with learning management systems where the social and cultural norms of higher education inform the design of learning management systems so that the most common use of them is as document repositories where students just go there to download content um, and, and access resources. And you know we can do the same thing with email that we mostly use uh, learning management systems for. Um, Jesse Stommel has this great uh, quote where he talks about education misrepresenting itself as objective, quantifiable and apolitical. And I think it is um, great that Laura made the point that um, education and educational technology is political. It's also social and economical and financial um, and ethical. All of these ideas that we don't necessarily bring into our, our teaching and learning frameworks. So I think the point is that higher education shapes technology into its own image. And it's actually really difficult to use the technology in ways that don't mimic some of the structures um, that we find within higher education. And I mean physical as well as conceptual structures. So we have classrooms where students sit in rows and we give them content and we see the same thing in learning management system where we have folders of content. We have cohorts of students where everything is kind of collapsed into these um, digital versions of a classroom where we give students content. Um, and so we see this trend where we use technology as the means by which we objectify and quantify learning. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Um, a comparative study design is really just where we try to determine group differences and whether or not the group differences affect the outcomes after we've implemented some kind of an intervention. Comparative studies tend to be experimental, but they need not be. And the sample of participants is assigned to different conditions and then compared for differences in outcomes. So essentially a comparative study design means that we say, we give one group of students one thing, we give another group of students another thing. We try to control all variables that influence the outcomes. And then we say that the only thing that may have led to those differences in outcomes are the differences within the group. And because we've controlled for all the variables, we wanna say that it's the teaching intervention that led to the difference. However, what we really find is no significant difference. So this is well documented enough that it's called the no significant difference phenomenon. And when you've read enough uh, research papers in um, educational technology, you will find that there was no significant difference in student learning outcomes. Um, so there's a hundred years of evidence that suggests that teaching with technology is likely to be no worse than traditional approaches. And by traditional, I just mean whatever you want to lump into that um, concept. Um, I think the most important finding to come out of all of this research is that the mode of teaching doesn't really change the outcome because there are too many other variables that are influencing um, the, the outcomes. And, and I think um, Felicianus has this great quote that um, mirrors, uh, I forget who said it earlier, um, I don't remember who it was, but we need to, I think it was you, Anne. Um, Scholarship should be organized around the problems we're trying to address, which are flagging learner engagement, poor teaching, rising cost of education, and so on, rather than the things we are using to solve those problems. Uh, learning analytics, online learning, gamification, 3D printing, and the like. It's not to say that these things aren't relevant, but they're a focus on, I think it was you, Anne, who talked about Reeves, who said the things of um, edtech um, rather than processes. So that's some of the problems that I think um, are relevant around this issue of comparative research design um, when we use edtech. So <clears throat> changing direction a little bit, um, 
uh, Ian McGilchrist has this great quote. He says, the model we choose to understand something determines what we find. So the way that we think about the world, our beliefs about the world influence the kinds of questions that we ask, which influences the kind of data we collect, which influences the conclusions that we reach. Um, so if we think about paradigms in the context of, of research paradigms, we talk about a positivist or an interpretivist approach. Um, very basically, a positivist tends towards an object of reality, which is the ground truth separate from the observer that's reducible to quantification. Uh, interpretive, interpretivists think, tend to think that there's no ground truth and that reality is explored through subjective experience. And I think those there are other um, paradigms, but these are the ones that we, we tend to focus on. And we see this when people talk about, you know, I'm a quantitative researcher, or I'm a qualitative researcher. And I think that those are heuristics for getting some insight into the, the way that some people think about the world. Um, so what we believe about the nature of reality informs the questions we ask to generate data about that reality. And this is the central question that I had, um, well, that, that I came to when I was trying to prepare for this presentation. I think that we have a fundamental belief that teaching causes learning. Um, that the things we do in the classroom um, have a tightly coupled relationship to the things that students remember. And the more I thought about it, the more I was wondering if that was really true. And I came across this quote by Paul Ramsden, where he says, it's not a simple matter of cause and effect. The important thing is the resolve of students themselves. They must use effort to convert the opportunity that we provide into the outcome. Students decide their own destinies and lecturers only add or subtract value at the margins. I thought that's a really powerful quote um, because it's, it's a reminder that we may not be as important um, as we believe that we are. Uh, but there are social and political pressures that require us to show that we're important. So we need to demonstrate that we're adding value. And this, I think, that belief, um, that pressure, that social and, and political pressure, I think that drives us to try and do the kinds of research that show, that prove, that what we do influences student learning, that our teaching causes learning. Um, and, I, and I'm not convinced that that's true. We're too confident that our teaching is the cause that leads to learning, which is the effect. In other words, the spatial and temporal relationships between what we do and what students learn is too tightly coupled. So we do something in the classroom, and then a week later, we test whether or not students remember more things. We talk about knowledge, but what we're actually testing most of the time is information retention, acquisition and retention. Um, and, and that relationship uh, it, between what we do and what students learn I think is too tightly coupled. So just as an example, we know that something we do in class today may set in motion a series of circumstances, none of which we control, and they result in an outcome maybe in six months or in 24 months, or maybe in five years time, somebody remembers something that one lecturer said that all of a sudden makes sense. We cannot control for all the confounding variables that might influence learning, and so we cannot link cause and effect. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. And again, a quote from Ramsden. Um, I could just read Ramsden all day and just pull out quotes that you can pull into these kinds of stories. Um, he has such great insights into teaching and learning. Um, he says teaching is less about causing learning and more about creating conditions in which students can choose to learn. Um, this slide is included here really because research around education is often very closely related to the assessment of learning. So a research project that looks at the outcomes of uh, teaching and learning interaction is really not much different to uh, some of the assessment tasks that we give our students. Um, Herbert Simon says that learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. So that's kind of a, a repeat of, of what Ramsden said. Um, I think for me, what this does is it really situates learning inside the mind of the student, and therefore it's not something that we can directly observe. So the dynamics of students' cognition are entirely cut off from our direct experience. The only way that we can try and assess student learning or evaluate student learning through research is to make inferences about their learning. And we do this by using proxy indicators like scores on assessment tasks. 
And I think that this would be kind of okay if we could be more confident that our assessments are valid and reliable. But we know that most of the time our assessments are neither valid nor reliable. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit later if, if anyone wants to question some of that. Um, I think what, what we like about assessment scores is that they feel objective and they're quantifiable. And this brings us back to what I was saying about earlier, or what Stommel said earlier, about higher education misrepresenting itself as quantifiable, objective, and apolitical. Um, I'm going to have a problem here advancing my slides. Um, so to change tack again, I think it's really useful to look at learning as an outcome of a complex system. I won't go into this in too much detail, and, and again, maybe we can talk about it later, but I increasingly see higher education um, as a complex system. There's many interacting elements. The elements in the system affect and are affected by other elements through rich interactions that are too numerous for anyone to really track. Small changes can have large effects. I don't know, I've had experiences where students come up to me and say, you know, there's this one thing that you said in class. You know, I've been talking for 60 minutes, but there's one thing I said that really made a massive difference in a student's um, insight or motivation and has led to a, re a really big change. You know, a throwaway comment that I made, a small thing leading to a very large effect. Interactions can feed back onto themselves. Systems are usually open, can be difficult or impossible to define boundaries. So where does learning start? Where does it end? Where does our influence on students start and where it ends? Where does it end? If a student's thinking about something I said on the bus on the way home, like, is that something that I caused? Um, it's, it's really difficult to say where I end and where students thinking begins. Um, energy is needed to maintain organization in the system, so the systems are not, higher education is not in equilibrium. It needs a constant introduction of, of energy. So that's just some of the ideas around whether or not higher education is a complex system. Now I'm going to try and advance my slides. Is that working? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, all right, cool. So within complex systems, we don't have normal problems. We have what are called wicked problems. Um, Lawrence Peter has described these problems as being so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. Some of the characteristics about wicked problems, there is no stopping rule. For example, there's no point at which you can say, well, learning is complete. Uh, we, there is a stopping rule if we say that the student has to acquire and retain a certain amount of information we're able to say with some confidence that yes, the student has retained this amount of information. But if we're talking about learning, which I would say is quite different to um, information retention, there is no stopping rule. Solutions to wicked problems are not true or false, but rather better or worse. Are some interventions better or worse than others? We're not able to ever say that a teaching intervention is right. There's no immediate or ultimate test of solutions. So we have no idea if an intervention that we implement on, uh, on one day is going to be the correct one. It may be that it takes 10 years to figure out whether or not an implementation of an intervention is actually better or worse than something else. Every solution is a one-shot operation because you can never repeat the experiment. Um, anything that you try, you're never going to be able to repeat with either that group of students or with another group of students. And if we come back to the story that I started with about the rats, um, you start seeing some of the challenges that we face in the classroom where we try to do these comparative type designs um, because the experiments just don't work. Every wicked problem is unique. Um, so every problem that we face um, with any cohort is, uh, is a unique problem. Um, it may be that on average they, they look the same, but every group of students is different to every other group of students. Every problem is a symptom of another problem. So we can keep reducing backwards and backwards um, we can say, well, students are not learning because uh, they're not paying attention, they don't engage. Why are they not paying attention and engaged? Well, it's because there's issues at home or they don't have enough food or because of load shedding or, you know, we can always go back to another problem that's causing the problems in the classroom. And that there's a lot of research that shows that we can't solve wicked problems. We can only move them forward. And if you can't solve a wicked problem, then um, a comparative design is really the worst um, the worst choice that you can make. Um, I realize that I'm making some quite firm, um, I'm, I'm making my firm opinions known here. Um, I think it's it's useful to phrase it like that, um, to, to make it distinct. Um, 
I'm not convinced about any of these arguments yet, as I said at the beginning. Uh, so the, the concern around comparative designs is that they focus on outcomes, uh, whereas I think that learning is something that is a process, um, and that fits with what I'm suggesting about learning being a wicked problem. It's a process that we move forward, that we can make better or worse, but which we can never actually solve. Um, Painter talks about this compulsion for metrics, and I think that's the right word. It's a compulsion for metrics. We want to be able to see data. We want to be able to see percentages and have cut scores and have ranking tables where we put students from best to worst. Um, and we think that these are some of the only ways to generate meaningful data about learning. Yes, there are qualitative designs, but qualitative designs also can focus on outcomes rather than process. Um, Angela Brew talks about this distinction between conceptions of research that are atomistic, so they're re reductive and they're oriented towards the production of outcomes, and conceptions that are more holistic with an orientation towards internal process, where the intention is to understand. So for me, I would like to see more research where we're trying to get inside the head of students to understand what's going on, um, what are the cognitive mechanisms that they're engaged in uh, to try and move their own learning forward. So we tend to pay attention on increases in knowledge. We call it knowledge. What we're actually talking about is information retention. We pay little attention to what's going on in the mind of the students, and I think that that's where the interesting stuff lies. Um, Biesta has a great paper where he talks about why what works uh, doesn't work, or something like that. Um, so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what works. So is A better than B? And less time asking what it even means for something to work. So I think the questions that are more interesting are works for who, for what, when, and how. But these are all process oriented questions. They don't offer simple measurable metrics um, that we can graph. Um, and, and this kind of comes back to something that I always think about is, is this publishable? Um, there are incentives to find positive results. No, no editor wants to publish your paper that concludes with, does it work? Well, it depends. Um, there's very little incentive for editors to publish that work. Uh, so it's very difficult even to design the kinds of research um, that I think is useful um, because that isn't what's going to get you promoted. Um, that's also a contentious statement that we can talk about. Um, so this is the point that I reached where I thought, well, now what? Um, so everything that I thought about teaching and learning, um, it doesn't feel like that's true anymore. And at first I thought, well, I must be missing something. And then I came across another quote by Biesta. Um, and I think if, if he's saying this, then I'm in good company. With so many uncontrollable factors and so many complex open dynamics, it seems as if education and the evaluation of education is almost impossible. So this is the point where, where I was at. Um, this feels like it's impossible. Um, so why bother? And I literally thought, well, we might as well just pack it all in, go home. Uh, I'm also reading a book called The More Beautiful Question, and one of the questions that um, is the, this author talks about being a beautiful question is to ask what if. And I said, OK, so if this idea, if this way of thinking about teaching and learning, if this tight connection between teaching and learning is not leading to the kinds of research that might be interesting, I said, what if? What if we separate out the practice of teaching with the process of learning? So we decouple the cause effect relationship between teaching and learning. So we don't evaluate teaching for its ability to cause learning, and we don't evaluate learning as an outcome of teaching. Instead of asking if A or B is better, we can ask students about their relationships with A and B. So how did you feel about, I'm not saying how did you feel as in satisfaction surveys, so I'm not a fan of those either, but what is your relationship with this teaching intervention? What is your relationship with this teaching intervention? Um, and are there directly observable behaviors aligned with what we know from cognitive science and educational psychology to be good learning behaviors? Um, there's a lot of assumptions built into that, into that phrase. Um, but the idea is that we can use learning theory and teaching frameworks to say that are the teaching behaviors that we observe in this teacher likely to lead to a more motivated student? Are the observable behaviors in the student likely to lead to more learning based on what we understand about cognitive science and educational psychology. Um, this will require a focus on learning theory and teaching frameworks, um, which can sometimes be scary. So in conclusion, 
I think that there are fundamental concerns with most comparative study designs. Um, I think that they're informed by beliefs that too strongly couple teaching with learning, which leads to this emphasis on cause-effect relationships. And when we believe that teaching is the cause of a, um, the cause of learning, then we want to do experiment, experimental type designs because experimental designs, comparative designs, are about coming to some kind of ground truth about whether or not this caused this other thing. We spend a lot of time talking about trans transformational learning, about identity transformation, but we spend all of our time measuring changes in information acquisition. So I think that we could shift our focus on becoming learners, which is a process, instead of how much learning, which is a product or an outcome. I think we can measure behavioral change in teachers and students and to ask which is more likely to have the long term impact. What do we do now that we didn't do before? I thought it was interesting that uh, this was completely unplanned, but Laura's first question is also my last question. Um, what do we really care about in higher education? Um, and I think to to ask ourselves, what are our fundamental beliefs about what it is that we're doing? They inform the kinds of questions that we ask. And I think it's really important that we start re-examining what our purpose is, um, our purpose in the classroom, our purpose as a kind of social structure, higher education, uh, universities. Um, and I think that this might give us some insight into how we might move forward. And then there's some reading that I thought might be useful. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you so much for that. Um, I must say I found that both grounding and sobering. And and I think it was really good to have that right at the end, because like you said, it brought us full circle. Um, and I just think there's so much there for us to to think about. Um, we, no matter what research approach we're using, those are the sorts of questions we should be asking ourselves. So I'm absolutely blown away by that. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, are there any questions for Michael? I must say that second last slide of yours, um, I mean, I put it in the chat. I really did feel that there's a paper coming on there, Michael. I have the habit of doing this when I'm in, <laughs> in meetings. And I mean, I, I do think you need to explore that because it was really, really deep. Um, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. It, with these kinds of things, I never know if I'm just wandering down a dead end that is, you know, useless. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to know that it was at least thought provoking. And like I said in the beginning, I kind of argued myself into a point where I didn't know how to get out of. Um, I just thought, well, this is all pointless. Why are we bothering? Um, but yeah, that, that's not especially useful for, for anyone. Um, but I think it, it might be an interesting approach. And I haven't seen this approach articulated in any of the research that I've seen, where there's a, a clear decoupling of the cause effect relationship between teaching and learning. So. I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something there. No, and I must say that, I mean, as as the moderator of the session, it's it's leaving me with something to go away and think about. And that's really what you want from this type of session. So I think uh, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, are there any questions for Michael? Michael, there's just things like, you know, lots to think about, very thought provoking. Um, and yeah, and Nicola's been very encouraging about, you know, any paper that you write about that possibly becoming a, a seminal paper. So, you know, Thank I think you. that's, that's very kind. you've got lots of motivation and encouragement from us then. So because we're nearly at 11 o'clock, what I'm going to do is say thank you very much to Michael.